And now that leads us to the analysis of Shields and Brooks. That is syndicated columnist Mark Shields and New York Times columnist David Brooks. Welcome, gentlemen. So we just heard from Robert Costa, David, about the Alabama race. It is on everybody's lips. Uh, as he said, not only in Alabama, but in much of Washington. But how, what do we make of it right now? There is so much attention on these women's accusations. But as Robert said, it's, it's gotten much bigger than that down there. Yeah, but, I, you know, what I hear is a lot of Republicans looking at the Roy Moore case, and it seems to have just flipped the switch. A lot of Republicans disgusted by Trump, uh, not liking Trump, conservatives. And then suddenly, Roy Moore, you enter a whole new realm of depravity, to be honest. Uh, how are people not nauseated with a guy hitting on 14-year-old girls? And then suddenly that guy becomes U.S. Senate, and people are not minding this. And so how many Republicans have I talked to have said, I guess I'm not a Republican anymore? And these are lifelong Republicans. Evangelicals saying, hey, I'm a Christian, but I'm not an evangelical. If that's what being an evangelical is, that I don't have to care about character, uh, that's not what I believe. And so to me, the, the big test of this is that, sure, if he wins, the Republicans will have one more vote for a couple of years, but they will have a generation who find the Republican Party something they can't relate to. And they'll find the pro-life movement as something that is a, a movement of epic hypocrisy. So they may get a short-term gain if he wins, but I think there will be a long-term generational setback for the Republican Party, for evangelical Christianity, for the pro-life movement, for all of the things that Donald Trump and Roy Moore purport to be for. S serious consequences if he wins. Serious consequences, Judy, uh, either way. If you're, if you're an Alabaman who loves your state, uh, who cares about your state, wants your children to grow up there and come back and the grandchildren not to move away, um, you're, you're, you're thinking about the fact that you've already had your overtly religious governor, uh, Republican, resign uh, with a, uh, a, a adulterous relationship with a woman staff member. You've had the Speaker of the House uh, invited, in, indicted, convicted on 12 counts of corruption uh, and uh, felony con convictions. Um, and you know that your state's been a punching bag. It's been a one-line uh, one joke. I mean, if it weren't for Mississippi, Alabama would be 50th at everything. And so you want pride in your state. You want a sense of self-respect. And Roy Moore is not going to help in any way. It's going to reinforce that negative stereotype. I think uh, I, Robert Costa is second to none as a reporter. But I think one of, one of the problems with the polling uh, which is, uh, quite frankly, uh, shown the race very, very close, is this. If you're a, a church-going Alabaman uh, who uh, is a Republican uh, and uh, you're, you face economic and maybe social pressure if you admit you're voting for Doug Jones, the Democrat, uh, but at the same time, if you're a, a, a church-going, serious Alabaman and you're going to vote for Roy Moore, uh, you face uh, moral uh, criticism. So I don't, the, the candor level in polling is, is pretty difficult. Right now, from everything I've been able to find out, I would say that Roy Moore will lose on Tuesday. Uh, really? I, I really do. Uh, now, it's 96 hours to go. The president's going down tonight. But I, I think, I think that Roy, uh, Roy Jones will spring a, uh, uh, Doug Jones will spring an upset. Uh, and uh, I think it'll be a, a political earthquake. But meantime, uh, in Washington, and, and David, which you were just talking about, you've, you've got the Republicans uh, torn asunder, if you will, by what's happened to Roy Moore. But Democrats came together this week and basically drummed Al Franken out of the Senate, a bunch of led by Republican, I mean, by Democratic women yeah. senators. So do we now have some sort of moral separation between the two parties? How do you... Read this. Well, I mean, it's it's indisputable that the Democrats have uh, kicked Al Franken and pushed him out of the Senate for things which are much less egregious than anything Roy Moore is accused of or anything Donald Trump is accused of. So there's that fact. I I, um, I would associate myself a little with a column Ruth Marcus, our friend Ruth Marcus, wrote today, which said it, we don't. It feels it would for the Al Franken case, it should be judged on the basis of Al Franken and what Al Franken did or didn't do. And it feels like we don't totally know. And it feels he was pushed out of the Senate, not just because of what Al Franken did, but because for the political opportunism of the Democratic Party to say, hey, we're not the Republicans. And so it felt like a lot of the pressure against Franken was not about Franken. It was just for political expedience so we could have the contrast with Roy Moore. And whatever Al Franken did and didn't do, and I bear I carry no water for him, it seemed a little unfair that his case had to be so much influenced by political expediency and Roy Moore. Unfair, Mark. 
I, well, we're in uncharted waters here. Um, yeah, I, I, I think capital punishment is not the answer for everything from uh, uh, winking at an at a office Christmas party or to uh, what Harvey Weinstein did. Um, and, and by the way, Judy, I, I just have to digress for a second and say if, if if you want to see newspapering at its best, this past Thursday's New York Times with uh, Megan Toohey and Jody Cantor uh, and Susan Dominus and Jim Rutenberg and four pages. And this is what, this is really the crime involved. This is a consortium of applying economic, social, personal, emotional, and, and physical pressure uh, and threats to anybody, a witness, a woman who wanted to uh, confess, or anything of the sort. And, and so. This was around the Harvey. supporting this was, Harvey Weinstein. This was about Harvey Weinstein. Uh, that's right, exactly. And, and, and everybody, it was like Donald Trump. Everybody who got near him is sane, stolid, and stained, sullied, and diminished by it. But this was, this was a, a, a terror, uh, uh, really, a terror organization. Um, this is not Al Franken. This is what Al Franken did. Um, but uh, th th there's no question that uh, the serial nature of it, the picture, the photographic evidence was damning. Putting and his hands on the hands the and, the, and the fact, yeah. Judy, quite honestly, that women led the, the, the march. I mean, that uh, that uh, wasn't just Kristen Jolly Brand, but the other women in the Senate. I mean, that that was it. When John Conyers fell, one of the founders of the of the Congressional Black Caucus, there was a question of double standard. There's no question that Democrats are trying to make this uh, draw a line between themselves. If in fact more and more wins or loses on Tuesday. If he wins, then he becomes the face, along with Donald Trump, of the Republican Party going into 2018, which is not good for the Republicans. If he loses, then there's only one person who hasn't paid some price for this charge, and that's Donald Trump. So e either way, Republicans are facing a very bleak Wednesday. Yeah. And, you know, the Republicans, all the, the honorable Republicans, thought, oh, this guy Trump will win. We'll give him a little. We'll, we'll sort of tolerate him. But I can still go ahead and have my honorable career. But the, the point I tried to make in a column today is he, Trump always asks something more. First, he asks you to tolerate his, his tweets, then his sexual harassment. Now you have to tolerate Roy Moore. The next question is going to be, oh, I'm going to fire Bob Mueller. You've got to tolerate that. And at every step along the way, the Republicans just say, we're not standing up to you you own a little more of our soul. And finally, he owns all of the soul. And that's the case whether you're working around Harvey Weinstein or you're working around Donald Trump. You make a deal with the devil, he takes over everything. And that's what's, happen that's what's happening in the Republican Party. They don't know where to draw the line. Well, another move uh, President Trump made this week, uh, Mark, that has uh, drawn uh, reaction all around the world is uh, to say that Jerusalem, the U.S. will recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Not only that, the U.S. is going to move its embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. <laughs> How did you read this move? Some people are saying it's just politics. Others are saying, no, this is what American presidents have promised they were going to do for years, and he's finally done simply what, uh, what Americans said they were going to do. Uh, presidential candidates have promised for years. Uh, Barack Pres Obama did not. Uh, he won twice without promising it. Bill Clinton did promise it, did not do it. Uh, George W. Bush promised it, did not do it. Uh, it, it was, it's, a pro, it's a very popular campaign statement, uh, and it's been particularly po popular with evangelical Christians, the idea of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and recognizing that. Uh, it is no accident that it happened in the week before the Alabama primary, uh, where Donald Trump, according to the Pew National Poll, has fallen uh, from 78% support among uh, evangelical Christians down to 61 percent, and this is this is seen. It, it's it's not it, it's not a, a, a foreign policy move. It's an isolating move for the United States. Uh, not not a single ally of ours in either Europe or or the Middle East has uh, has backed us on this. Um, it, Netanyahu, Bibi Netanyahu's government is pleased, and I'm sure I'm sure several uh, others are. But uh, it's not a strategic move. It's a political move. How do you read it? Well, I, I think the first thing to say, it is a fact that the Israeli Knesset is in West Jerusalem, the Prime Minister's office is in West Jerusalem. West Jerusalem is the, is the capital of Israel. Now, if we put our embassy in West Jerusalem and we recognize West Jerusalem as, as the capital of Israel, that is not a, a statement of something new. That's just the fact. To me, it does not rule out any two-state solution. In any two-state solution, where the, US cap where the Israeli capital is, that's always going to stay Israel. What part of East Jerusalem becomes Palestine, that's what the negotiation would be about. So to me, it doesn't necessarily 
destroy or create anything new. It just revives a fact that's already on the ground. Now, if I were counseling the president, I'd say it's, it's perfectly fine to move the, the embassy to West Jerusalem, but you've got to get something from the Israelis for it. You've got to make it part of a deal. And the deal would be you're going to stop settlements. If you stop settlements, we'll give you this gift. And that strikes me as a, as a reasonable thing that other administrations have broached, to just give them this without any striking any deal, without it getting any concessions that will help simmer the, the region down. That strikes me as just a stupidity. What about that, Mark? I mean, this could just this could be a way to ease the a way into a peace process if you can get the Israelis to to give something back. If, if in fact it, it were, Judy, but would would not one want to announce that? Wouldn't one indicate it? I mean, uh, this is not a man known for his subtlety, uh, for his uh, uh, unwillingness to uh, uh, mention major achievements of his. I mean, th this looks like a straight political act on his part. This is the man who wrote the art of the deal, or somebody wrote the art of the deal under his name. And uh, if this is the deal, uh, th there is th there's no quo for the quid. And the consequence, just quickly about the consequence. I mean, there have been protests. Uh, we reported yep. earlier they're not as bad as David as they had been expected, but you could see uh, you could see conflict and and worse. Uh, yeah. In in the, I mean, in some the of that's airport. legitimate uh, from the Palestinian side. They've. It's, they've sort of messed up the peace process. There's no question about that. Some of them is not legitimate. Hamas doesn't recognize the existence of the state of Israel, period. So them, the distinction between East and West Jerusalem is not a distinction they make. They think they should have the whole region. So some of the opposition is just based on the idea that there will no, be no Israel state. Nonetheless, among sophisticated people on both sides, it's no doubt true that if you thought there was a peace process going on, which I'm not sure there is, this no doubt makes it much, much harder. Much more difficult. Nine of the last 11 U.S. ambassadors to Israel and the presidents of both parties uh, have criticized and, uh, and faulted this decision by President Trump. Just a minute or so left, but I do want to ask you about the tax uh, legislation, Mark. The, uh, the Senate has now passed it. Uh, they're trying to work it out between the House and the Senate. Tell us, what does your crystal ball say? This, what is it? the final result going to look this like? Is, this is, uh, it's going to look you know, like redistribution in the country, I mean, that, uh, in the worst sense, uh, economically. But, Judy, it, it, it's become the Republicans' last gasp. Uh, we've got to do it. I mean, there's almost a, a desperation and urgency about it. Somehow, if, if we do this, things will get better. Uh, that they will. I mean, I think there's a, I mean, already you've seen Jeff Flake and, and a senator from Arizona and Susan Collins, senator from Maine, uh, have the House Republicans sabotage submarine the concessions that were made to get their votes. Uh, you know, but I, I, I still think that that desire for unity, for something to show and to reward their donors is deep. Yeah, it's, it's likely to pass. There's some hope, I have some hope, that Susan Collins will walk away be, just because it's polling terribly. The, the people in the Senate are not happy with it as a piece of legislation. They're only passing it because they want unity. But I have some 10 or 20 percent hope that, that Susan Collins, maybe Flake, some of the others will say, oh, we can't, we couldn't come to a good deal in, in conference and we're going to walk away from this and thing. And then it goes up in flames? Right. That would not be likely, <laughs> but... <laughs> how, about it, how about if Jones wins on Tuesday? Well, then it becomes, <laughs> well, it becomes much more likely that it, it goes down. All right. Uh, you heard it here first. David Brooks, Mark Shields. Thank you both. Thank you, Judy. Thank you.